Arratxaldeon, kaizo, arratxaldeon, eta ongi etorri guzti guzti. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome once again to this very important event that gathers us together here at Bilbao at the International Literature Festival Gutun Surya, once again here at the Ascuna Centra. So, Verbo Dariola, the overflow and conversation. So, this is the title of uh, this year's event uh, and edition, and this is about talking without any uh, borders in a boundless way. And we're going to welcome today to this very special opening of this uh, festival, Gutun Surya, that is an international literature festival that takes place here at the Ascuna Centroa. So we've been listening to Percus Bica, and they will stay with us today. There will also be the closing band. We will listen to another piece later on. We started with some uh, music. Then we will listen to some words, and we will finish uh, with some uh, drums. They played Lossa, a very special piece by uh, Emmanuel Serge Gourdet, the French artist. And now it is time to introduce our guest that will join us on here on the stage. So please join us here on this stage. The Gianna Garcia, also Fernando Perez, he is the director from uh, Ascona Centro, Gorka Martinez, BBK uh, director. Please a round of applause. And with uh, this round of applause, of course, we also would like to welcome the director of the Ascona Centro, Fernando Perez. Good afternoon and thank you very much for attending. Thank you for attending this opening, a new edition of this International Literature Festival that we open today and uh, that we will be closing on March the 2nd. So you are all invited to take part on this overflowing of this overflowing conversation without any limits, any boundaries. So under this uh, title, overflowing conversation, we uh, would like to start a very courageous uh, conversation that is uh, starting in such a way. A conversation without any limits or boundaries. So there is also room for conversation, for talks. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, good practices of some uh, of the artists that we consider to be very important and we do so together with our main sponsors. I would like to, of course, thank you, arts and literature, for their fundamental contribution in order to uh, hold this event. And he now sort of repeats in Spanish, uh, welcome all to this International Literature Festival. You're all invited up to the 2nd of March uh, to be part of this overflowing conversation with no limits, no boundaries. So the title of this year's edition, I think, uh, means uh, Berba Dariola means that we could be very courageous and dairy when we uh, talk uh, about uh, unknown subjects and territories. This festival is also a place to acknowledge creation. This is why we award every year to different uh, fundamental authors in the field of uh, literature this award, the BBK Gurun Suriya Atun. This we, we do this together with our main partner, uh, that is the BBK uh, Foundation. And we have with us today Gorka Garcia from the BBK uh, Foundation. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for uh, being here to today with us for a new edition of Gutun Surya Literature Festival. I think we are going to really enjoy it as we've been doing in uh, the previous years. So uh, we only like to say that together, BBK and the Athkuna Centra will always be in pay special interest to literature, arts, and books and literature. But uh, books and literature, they also require their authors. This is why some years ago we decided to uh, grant an award to international and uh, international and Basque authors. And I think uh, this year we made a very good choice. I think you are going to share the decision we made. First of all, we have Maria Sun Landa. She's uh, very well known because for many years she's been spreading uh, the Basque language uh, through uh, literature to, for children and youngsters. And then we also have Juan Mayorga, as you all know. He is also part of the Basque Academy. He is a university professor and he also uh, works in the field of performing arts whenever he can. So really, I think these two awards uh, are very well deserved. Thank you very much. Eta nola ez, Fernando Keta Gorkako oso ondo adierazi diguten bezala oso ekitaldi berezia da. As Fernando Angorka mentioned, this is a very special event with two awards, the BBK Gutun Surya 2024, first of all, and the first award goes to Juan Mayorga. He is really a benchmark in the field of encounters and uh, also uh, talking about silence as the main element of a conversation as well. Juan Mayorga could not make it uh, here today, but we uh, have a video that he sent uh, to say thank you. Well, here I am through this screen saying thank you to the Azcuna Central and the Gabilbao uh, people. Thank you for uh, granting me this uh, great award, BBK Gutun Surya. I think you didn't get an award because of what you've done, but rather for what people expect uh, from you. I think this is a way to pay respect to what I've been uh, doing and I do fully respect you and I hope I will be worth uh, this uh, award in the future. I am at the Theatre of the Abadia where we are repeating, uh, we're rehearsing a uh, play. This is why I cannot make it to Bilbao today, but over the weekend, on uh, March the 3rd, he says, uh, it is rather the 2nd, uh, there uh, I will attend your festival and I will uh, be having a very uh, interesting conversation with two of your authors like uh, Pachi Lazaro and Pedro Subia. Hopefully that conversation, I hope, is going to be really worth it. I am sure that Pedro and Pachi will say very interesting things. So uh, up until the 2nd, I just want to send you a big, big hug and say thank you for your award. Well, so with that hug, we now move on to the delivery to the uh, of this award. Uh, Lady Enunciaga is going to uh, give this uh, commander cane to Iñaki Esteban um, on behalf of uh, Juan Mayorga. And the second award, Gutun Surya BBK, Gutun Surya Bilba, goes to Maria Sun Lanta. She is a very good author. She writes literature for children and youngsters. And she is a very important author, as I said, for children and youngsters. She says uh, in Basque and then in Spanish these words. 
Well, good afternoon. Thank you to the Ascuna Centra and to the rest of the team and uh, thank you to the uh, audience for attending this event. What could I say? As Mayorga just uh, said, or oh, well, my particular case, I don't think they thought of me because of, because of what I'm going to be doing in the future, but also because of what I've done, because I, had, or I have already a certain age. So I think this command again is really good for me, it really suits me, because it will help me sort of walk in a more stable way because I have a certain age. And this makes me think of the uh, Makia Kiski story the Makia Kiski Command Kane story. And uh, in that tale, somebody said, well, this is a cane. I'm going to hit you if you are around me. You don't do as I say. And uh, now I would love to be able to sing or to improvise some poetry, but I am unable to do any of those uh, things. So uh, I just would like to say long life uh, to Bilbao because Pachi Tsubisarreta and myself, we were really astonished. These people from Bilbao, you cannot beat them. So, well, thank you very much, Maria Sin. Well, thank you very much uh, for your words, Maria Sunlande. Now it's time to listen to some more music. We're going to listen to some drums uh, played by Perkus Bika. They're going to play a piece by a Serbian author. This is a very simple uh, piece that is full of contrast. I hope you enjoy it. Well, thank you very much. Imp it's an impressive, impressive uh, performance. So we're going to listen to many interesting performances over this festival and we're going to hold the fest of uh, many conversation starting with Maria Sunlanda and Pachi Suizarreta. This is a really necessary conversation with two of the most important actors of uh, uh, literature for children and youngsters. And we remind you that after this conversation, Maria Sun Landa and Pachi Sugarata will be signing books at the foyer. And now she's repeating this in Spanish. So we're going to start this conversation. And we're going to start to open Guten Surya 20. 24. Hope you enjoy.
Urbildoko gure arrizkan. Bai, arratxaldeon, arrastion, guztioi. Hemen gaitu zue... Well, good afternoon. We cannot really see the ocean, the the audience, the the audience. And we've been told so, but this is pretty dangerous because since we do not see the audience, then we might be able to say or do anything. Well, we're glad to know that you are here, and we're very happy to be here to collect this award. And recently we also got together in Victoria, but it's always a great pleasure to come to Bilbao, see friends, and to come to such a building with this magnificent uh, library. And uh, we've been told that this conversation could go in many directions. And I told Marianne so that maybe we should start with one of her texts and from there try to uh, make uh, people guess. We will be talking about serious issues and serious subject matters. Sometimes also when you sort of uh, have a conversation with a beer in your hand and some uh, tapas or pinches, maybe you're not that serious. But when you talk about uh, literature for youngsters and uh, for children, uh, it is not that serious, is it? And I come here with a proposal. It's an open proposal, Maria does not know about. I think this is like a metaphor, a metaphor of literature, and it goes like this. What is that that you have in front of you, in front of your eyes, that looks like a butterfly and makes the sound of a watch? It is in front of us. It looks like a butterfly, but it sounds like a watch and goes tick tack, tick tack. So this is a very easy guess. What is it? Our eyelashes. Sometimes in Basque language, the children say it wrong and they say the eyebrows instead of the eyelashes, but it's the eyelashes. This morning we opened our eyes, we saw the light or we turned on the light and maybe that is what literature is about, to sort of approach those very simple things that we uh, end up no longer seeing or appreciating our, in our daily uh, life. So this is why I was sort of uh, making Maria Asunges uh, uh, with this uh, riddle. Uh, I was, uh, Maria Asun says, I was like wondering what is here? Taking me by an ophthalmologist? Well, when I got an award from Makunde, the Women's uh, Association, I thought I'm going to write a text about the Sleeping Beauty. And I think he's now talking about this uh, riddle because this is because of how I told him I consider the Sleeping Beauty uh, before I got this award. And I have these tags. It is said, or the legend goes, that the uh, Sleeping Beauty uh, had her eyes closed, but she was not really sleeping. She was only pretending while waiting for a prince, a beautiful, a good-looking prince uh, to come. And whenever she heard uh, a noise, maybe the wind outside or some branches or some people walking nearby, and if that could mean that the prince was approaching, then she would pretend she was in uh, deep sleep. But not snoring, of course, because, you know, princesses and sleeping beauties do never snore. And she was told that a prince was uh, to come. And she was told that a prince would never come, a prince would never come in princesses uh, would uh, keep their open eyes. And I guess you understand what I mean. If you're a princess and you keep your eyes wide open, then 
no prince will approach you. So then she smiled until night uh, came and then the story grew into different directions and people say that uh, now the princess, she is uh, doing a PH on misogyny. Some other people say Sleeping Beauty sort of uh, went away into a known uh, land uh, seeking freedom. And some other people said that she came out of the closet and went to marry um, White as Snow as Snow, the other uh, well known uh, tale uh, character. Snow White. Yes, I really like that. That's what I wanted you to read it. He says, a friend of yours, uh, Carmela, came to Victoria and he told me, well, that happened to me with uh, Marie Ascent and uh, Simon de Beauvoir and some other uh, paths that you would sort of open uh, for them. You open many women, open their eyes. Well, she says, yes. I remember that there was a very young psychologist that uh, mentioned Simone de Beauvoir when it was not easy to know uh, her work. And since then, she's always been one of these very important uh, people uh, due to her good works. But I used to tell Carmele, yeah, to me, Simone de Beauvoir is a benchmark but you used to have a boyfriend with a motorbike and I would go walk uh, with some books uh, under my arms uh, while you were, you were 17 and you were riding a bike with your uh, boyfriend. So I was just like walking on my own with my books. Well, at Victoria, Mirna Gurbe Abe said something that I really uh, liked and that you've also mentioned today. This is what came to my mind, this comparison. Joseba Sarrenandia said that literature, Basque literature, was like a colorless uh, literature. There was only black and white literature. But I think now we have the freedom to use colors. And uh, precisely Sumeta, he was about colors and abstraction. We could, when we could only see the colors and figurative uh, artwork. And Miren Agur Meabe was precisely underlining your colors, the colors in your work. Well, she says, yes, this is uh, making me think of uh, this comment. See what you think of it. I think uh, we've been working better the field of uh, humor in the literature for youngsters than in, in literature for adults. Uh, that's my impression. It seems like some writers, some authors, they allow to sort of laugh at themselves. So it is not only about fantasy. I think we sort of are more connected with uh, children inside of uh, us. So you've mentioned about colors, but we can sometimes also talk about uh, absurd uh, humor. Uh, I remember how it would be very funny for me, the early tales by Ataga. Or by Lerchundi. I remember those influences, the impact those first works had uh, on me because yeah, they would give color and uh, humor to the Basque literature. And the case of the literature for adults, it was far too sort of uh, deep in Basque language. It was very thoughtful very severe and also very interesting. But it's true, true that that freshness was not there in the liter Basque literature for adults. And I think that, that we could also appreciate it in the writers themselves when they uh, decided to be more playful when writing for children or, or youngsters. And I think an accomplice of us, I'm not going to mention his name or her name, uh, said that uh, 
this uh, writer was often asked to write in Spanish because they considered that Basque literature was so much about uh, reflections and it was too sort of not heavy but too profound. Uh, do you think that is the case? Do you think it is related to the genre? Well, I'm a bit away from literature. I mean, uh, in literature in Spanish and the presence of a humor. Do you think that is the case? Well, I don't know. It is quite difficult for me to give you an answer because I'm a bit kind of away from that kind of literature. I don't know what they are doing nowadays. Maybe what they are doing, I'm not very much into it. I maybe not like it too much. Some of this literature is pretty sort of uh, distant to me. I'm a bit away from it. I think childhood is the best uh, place uh, to use color. Maybe, maybe I am not answering your question, but this is a conversation. And uh, oftentimes in conversations, I've heard that you were very much concerned about uh, these uh, literature about for youngsters and uh, children. Yes, he says, because I uh, sometimes so, so say it from the point of view that uh, being a teenager is a very difficult period in your in your life. Sometimes. Uh, we sometimes uh, sort of uh, write books for adults and then we tell children to read these books for adults. And uh, this is also the case now when they are very much uh, uh, related to screens. Uh, they are watching the screens uh, constantly, but maybe we could sort of uh, tell story that happened uh, a century ago or for example about the Spanish democratic transition. Uh, through a screen, but I think language is something that goes very fast, and I think from that point of view, the uh, uh, literature for children sort of allow us uh, to treat uh, emotions in a more relaxed uh, way. We can talk about fear and about other universal subjects. And I think in the case of uh, teenagers and youngsters, maybe it is uh, their time to write the literature they would like to read. There was a literary encounter and there were youngsters in the audience. We were sharing uh, some talks and uh, they were much away and uh, what we were doing had not much to do with them and um, we have our own sort of uh, uh, backgrounds and we do not all feel the same uh, motivation and uh, this is why some of uh, this other literature you were mentioning is no longer interesting or appealing to me and I've been writing about sorts of universal subjects, like, for example, if a man tells uh, uh, a son or a daughter who they should marry, well, then that is a very universal subject. Saria also was a very courageous uh, choice on your behalf, uh, and he got uh, this National Literary Award. Well, some say this is uh, literature for uh, children and youngsters, but maybe some people do have to try to get this Lizardi Award because uh, for us, uh, for us, as writers, those are the equivalent to the novel awards. I know that when we write for children and youngsters, we talk about universal subjects and more and more often we hear that they are losing the gift of imagination because they are now surrounded by screens. The screens we provide them. So this is something I wanted to ask you about. How do we start a tale? A fairy tale. Mm, 
you start f uh, from an image, something that you uh, remember from your childhood. Well, I've been doing it in many different ways, she says. Of course, I uh, sort of uh, look back at my own uh, childhood and I've got around me two very young uh, children and I look at them in a pretty uh, special way because I am a grandmother and many of you uh, being a grandmother or grandfather, you realize about this and then you realize while observing them, your gaze is a very different one because you are in a different moment in your life. And while observing them, watching them, you're sort of doing some kind of philosophy and you're also sort of uh, uh, moving back to your own childhood. So I think that exercise of observing them or watching them, I think it is my source of inspiration. Maybe in the past, I would think of a role play game or some adventurous story. But now, right now, I think my source of inspiration, well, I think you do not, do not know about a text of mine, but they gave me a photography, a picture by a local photographer, a baitua, and to different women, they gave us different photographies. Uh, we should write a uh, one page a text after that. And then I was inspired uh, to write a story where when I was three years old, uh, my uh, brother uh, died and then I wrote something about that. So that is what sort of uh, uh, comes out uh, from my soul. It's like, you know, I am sort of sharing this uh, ghost of uh, my past. Uh, and uh, when now I see a different series that precisely talk about this idea, about whether these ghosts of our past are here with us or not, uh, since this is quite a trendy subject. And if we're going to then apply this to the youth literature or children's literature, we should do it in a light way. Yeah, because you've been writing about uh, death, uh, he says, and there also that is about uh, being surrealistic as well, isn't it? Yes, she says, why not? Besides, I think that people, let's say that people, they have an idea about uh, literature for youngsters or uh, children that is pretty wrong. They are not aware of how rich this genre is. I think they don't sort of ask much about this kind of uh, books. They don't expect these books uh, to change uh, one's life. But when you grew, we used to grow without the TV set, we would sort of look into ourselves and we will be entertained thanks to book. And that is something people no longer is doing. And I think people, that is why they're still thinking that uh, literature for youngsters is not something very important. And they say, I will not even write that kind of literature. So what I mean is that it seems that we are only asking from this kind of literature to be easy, to be entertaining. Uh, that really gets on my, on my nerves because maybe it's because I am a professional, because, uh, because for me, the fact that a book should be easy to read, to be read, that's not to me a good uh, criteria to, to choose it. Jose Zamago, came uh, to a local library 
And we were lucky now to be with uh, Sara Mago then in Lanzarote, uh, thanks to a publishing house. They took us there. And at the time, the communication so, uh, was not very uh, close. And uh, the thing is, maybe it was not the right time. And I had uh, read uh, a series of uh, tales by Sara Mago. And I think. Alfaguara then was uh, publishing these as a sort of a series of uh, books uh, for uh, children, like tales for children. And when this was introduced in Italian, uh, he would always say that a child told him, well, this is not really interesting. And uh, he said, well, I've been awarded a Nobel Prize, but I cannot write uh, for uh, children. So this is what you said, more or less, that some people think that uh, uh, writing for children is a piece of cake, and it is not. And I remember that maybe a publishing house would call me and say, in two weeks' time, I want a tale to be uh, written, and they will give you a subject matter like uh, uh, road education or mobility and then I was there uh, telling myself do they know what writing for children is about this was the case uh, with this uh, tale that is a page long or so I don't know if you know about it sometimes I make a resolution I have to write this but then I cannot be creative because also creation is about magic and when you're forced to do something it doesn't happen yes she says because you've got to know that magic of creation because either you know about it or you do not sort of gasp it you don't really understand it I think writers should also try to write in order to get to know themselves and to get to know the experience of uh, the lit literary experience. Well, you've been a university professor and sometimes it is said that uh, education is about few verbs and that writing and reading are two important verbs. That is, uh, knowing to write in a quiet way and uh, living the experience of uh, reading. Yes. You are right, but this is not very important at university, it is not part of the main curriculum. I think, uh, well, I was a teacher for some years, like uh, 20 years, and there you might find it is an option to teach this. But literature was one of the main subject matters to be taught. But then the literature experience, that is getting to know that experience, that is reading, learning, learning from what you read because did you uh, learn to uh, write at uh, university no you didn't and i didn't either now there are many workshops to sort of uh, teach people how to write but really you uh, learn to write by reading and learning from what you read and uh, well, I was very lucky. My students were very serious people. They would really uh, make beautiful PowerPoints uh, for me. Those uh, would look uh, really astonishingly nice. And also the content was pretty good. Sometimes I even felt kind of very small because I am pretty much analogic and I could, was not up to the tasked to the level of these students but uh, what happened is that we would read a book and then when we would uh, sort of introduce the book they would say well this book is to sort of approach a racism and talk to about that subject to children or to talk about feminism and of course Pachi well you and I we've been knowing each other for many years 
and as uh, Dr. T said, what is literature for? For nothing. It just helps you breathe. This is how we see it. And if we do not teach them to breathe and that literature is about breathing, then they end up not grasping it. Because we always try to make literature be a tool. So this is why it should be easy, that it should be good for something. And this is uh, what you know we see at uh, university and also professors or teachers they sort of take it to take in take it to heart and it's not they don't sort of talk about the feeling and the experience i think if uh, some people are going to come here and to listen to us we're going to also have students from university coming to listen to us and i guess if the uh, room is going to be the theater is going to be that this dark uh, maybe some people are going to be moving around with their backpacks and so on and so forth especially if we have youngsters attending but i think it's very important to believe what we say and Gonzalo Mores used to say and in one of his tales, a person receives a letter from uh, his or her lover. And uh, then this person will go to bed and keep the letter among their legs and uh, between their legs and uh, or his or her legs. And uh, then that night was much better. So I think uh, literature is like um, of this fireplace that you have to keep you warm in your loneliness. <laughs> Seems like nowadays we should better keep uh, uh, letters uh, behind, uh, uh, underneath the pillow rather than in between our legs. Well, she says that you realize now how many children, very young uh, children, have now access to pornography. We still are not letting them read some specific literature that is a bit erotic. Why not? But rather more like warm. So we ban them from uh, read these. But on the other hand, we give them a screens where they can gain access to porn. And I think this is... Uh, um, worse and worse and I think there is this controversy about Royal Dart it seems we should uh, modify the work by Royal Dart I mean this is censorship and I refuse it uh, I think maybe we're also self-censoring -censor ourselves and I'd like to mention this uh, to you I think literature since we're talking about uh, literature in a literature festival and given the effort made in order to bring here Juan Mayorga and maybe we're also going to have here uh, on a st at the stage uh, Rosa Montero. I've read a uh, work by Benial, a French writer, a really, really harsh piece of work. And this made me uh, feel that in the past, the relationship with the publishing houses was much different. I think now a day we have more of a marketing type relationship with our publishing houses, which was not the case in the past. How do you see this? when you think of your granddaughters uh, and uh, nieces and nephews. Well, Pachi, she says, I don't want you to feel sad. I think we are in a pretty uh, much a sad situation. I often now listen to new writers, young writers, say that they really, especially the young uh, women writers, they feel very much respected by the publishers. 
and uh, I know a couple of uh, women writers that they've just published uh, books and they are both very much uh, well thankful to their publishing houses. I never had this kind of relationship of much uh, support, especially when we uh, used to write in Basque language. It was uh, rather about uh, sort of uh, encouraging the language and uh, spreading the language. And uh, I consider that was okay because it was never uh, one of my uh, strengths. Uh, so it was good for me to get that feedback uh, about uh, the language and my work uh, proof for the language. But then I would read uh, books and I would see that there is Jose Antonio here. How are you going to write suicidal? Well, but the Basque tribe, in the Basque tribe, one should say, yes, I'm going to use the word suicidal. And uh, luckily, ironically, I say this, that word was very much uh, getting very trendy because there were many suicidal sort of uh, uh, coups at the time. And uh, then it really spread, that word really got to spread it. But in my case, it was rather like when you are going to sort of uh, hang uh, your socks in the line and the laundry line, and then the socks say, we don't want to be hanging here, and we go away. And that is what I said. I don't want to be hanging here. I decided that I had to be like the uh, suicidal uh, socks jump off the line and do what you feel like doing. I think in the case of the Basque literature, we have uh, very promising uh, writers and also publishers. And I think they were good at uh, doing what they do. And now also they're thankful for that think that is changing and then there is also this idea that we are kind of a commercial object and also as you mentioned uh, when you have to uh, talk about a certain subject matter and then there are things like uh, Harry Potter because uh, we've got to tackle also Harry Potter uh, luckily it's been something that happened in the 20th century uh, children's, uh, they sort of made that books uh, their own and they took them wherever they wanted to. And I think in the case of literature for adults, we see it in a different way. Well, yeah, she's a millionaire, uh, rolling. Uh, well, now you consider her in a different way. Well, maybe at the time uh, for her, uh, literature for children was a serious uh, thing. Yeah, she was, uh, she hit uh, the right uh, button. Yeah, this is like uh, a tale, you know, when one is desperate. This lady that is really desperate, she's about to die. And suddenly, she just like hits the right uh, button, and uh, really, uh, congratulations! Because uh, I take my heart off to this lady. She's a great uh, writer, of course. But she did the right thing at the right time. And we often say literature should be educational. Well, we have this other example. This is a fantasy book, 25 years later, still very successful. Then there are some sequels that are pretty terrible. 
Well, he says, since we are in Bilbao, we should mention also our good relationship with Balzola. I think in literature for children's and youngsters, there was like an avant-garde. Some people that took the sort of more adventurous uh, path. Yeah, I think there was more of a freedom for writers and um, uh, illustrators and publishers. Yes, because I think this kind of literature, for in this kind of literature, there was more room for color, for freedom. Then some other people came through Elena Odiozola. These two cars uh, through another path, but I learned a lot uh, through, oh, thanks to Asun Balzola. But not about literature, about life. She really taught me a lot. I guess I taught her something as well because she was very much from Bilbao, kind of lady. And uh, she would tell me, "Well, nobody tells me the things you tell me." because she would love to write and then I would take uh, her text and then I would sort of review them and criticize her and sometimes she would say, well, nobody there's uh, telling me these uh, things, uh, no publisher in house does. And they say, well, I do. And I think I have to. And also, it is often said, I don't know if this is your particular case as well or not, sometimes we've got like this uh, duet of illustrators and uh, writers. I think we're very, we're very close, but we would uh, do, each of us would do her part. Sometimes people think that illustrators are uh, drawing while writers are writing. That was not the, uh, like that. In my case, I would write my text, uh, do it as well, as, as good as possible. Then I will give it to the publisher and then I will show it to her. And I do the same with her work. In a tale, I think she uh, draw a palm tree. And then I said, why do you have a palm tree here? There is no palm trees in my tail. And she said, like, well, I wanted to have a palm tree. And this is like uh, joking with Elena and Umbrella. Even if we were sort of uh, telling a story in the desert, she, he will... Uh, draw uh, an umbrella. But we have a good relationship. Ath Sumbalzola, she had a certain age and I learned a lot from her, but especially I learned from her how to face life. I learned about her attitude in life. And uh, I think um, Oftentimes you have a similar sensitivity, you share books, and uh, that makes that uh, artistic uh, jewel sort of uh, uh, be good because uh, deep down you are friends. Maybe Basque uh, writers, he says, we are a bit like sadder. And in the case of uh, comics, Journal Ariaga and others. Maybe they are contagious and they make us be more cheerful. And um, that is interesting to me. These people doing comic strips, they are sort of changing us. I like uh, Asti Berry, the publishing house, they are uh, really uh, doing beautiful things for younger people. I, am, I feel a bit jealous because they do beautiful things for the youngsters. Are we running out of time? Should we uh, give the floor to the audience? Well, hopefully they will switch on the lights so we can see the audience. 
Can we move on to questions? Nobody's guiding us. Well, before I forget, I'd like to vindicate literature. I'd like to vindicate I know that uh, people are there very dear and close to me are going to come to Bilbao. But I think to me literature is about breathing. Literature is something that sort of makes us, allow, allows us to breathe. There's a metaphor that I wanted to mention because you are wearing a red uh, foulard. So I read an essay from Arantxa Urreta Vizcaya. It seems during the Second World War, there was a concentration camp. I don't know if you know about this story. There was a women's concentration camp. And when the Americans came, it seems those women, they were uh, in a very bad uh, situation, very bad condition. They were in the cold court yard and the captain walked into the doctor's uh, cabinet and somebody was there uh, dead and uh, uh, this lady she was sort of covered by uh, a blanket and she was holding something in uh, her hand and when they opened her hand she was holding their uh, lipstick and this is why I understand that all the rest of these starving women that were in a very poor condition, they were all outside in the courtyard, but wearing lipsticks. They all were, they were all wearing a red lipstick because it seems that some of them Instead of, it seems that in a, in a given moment, instead of getting food into the camp, uh, there was a mistake and what they took to the camp was some lipstick, some cosmetics. And so to them, this was a moment of joy and they decided to all wear these red lipsticks. Well, we've been previously signing books for the Mediateca and we've been using colors. I am wearing black, it is true, but I need colors. Uh, a friend of mine, a poet, would tell me, no, you should wear uh, black. And I said, no, no, really. Uh, uh, some people say you should not even write with a pen. You should uh, really uh, write uh, with, a, not with a pencil, but with a pen. I like it when I come with Bilbao. I use more colors. No, that's not my case, really. I'm quite uh, prosaic. Sometimes when I had to write uh, in a book for a child, I would sometimes sort of uh, uh, put a keys there. I no longer do it. Imagine now in one of these uh, book uh, exhibitions, I decide to, when I am writing dedications, uh, to sort of, uh, in every book, sort of uh, stamp my kisses, my, my lips. Once I read Javier Cercas, that he and his friends had reached a conclusion in life. They would get together like once a week and sort of sort out the whole universe. And I think, I see this also in you. I think in your attitude, We've always been pretty close. And I think you've always been very much uh, engaged in social uh, subjects, that you're very much uh, connected to reality. Even if you work with fantasy, you are very much grounded. And Javier Cercas would say that in your life, you need a doctor, 
Kenny the Doctor because he allows you to uh, be born, to die, and accomplish that sort of walks life uh, with you. Also, a teacher, a teacher that uh, should sort of walk with you, and somebody also that should tell you, no, don't do that. Yeah, it should tell you no in an engaged way. And sometimes in our in our genre, sugar has been used uh, too much. And not only sugar, but also cream and honey has been used in our storytelling. So I think uh, how you do things is very important. It is uh, often said that it is important to say no, but when you have to do it, she says, well, well, it's only once. Yeah, saying no is very important. And it is not easy. Precisely. I think Amaya told me that today there were going to be some dances they were organizing some dancing and I was invited uh, to be part of it and I am pretty skeptic I think given a certain age you you become more skeptical they said, why don't you take a picture and then we can organize a video with some artists against the Gaza massacre. And I did it, but it didn't come out natural to me. I don't know whether we're not making children and youngsters be very much too much skeptical. I think in the past we were more enthusiastic about things. I don't know, we're not like sort of uh, sharing with them uh, too much a, skeptic, uh, a skepticism, you know. Uh, I think we should also talk about utopias and uh, about ideals. I think through our profession, and I remember that when I started, things were much more clear for me. I knew better what I could do. And now you have Ukraine, Gaza, and uh, another woman being killed. I mean, this really makes me sick. Really sick. So it's difficult to share enthusiasm nowadays. I think as a society, we're not going through a very creative or utopian moment. I think saying creative and utopian maybe is uh, too much uh, to say, but I don't think we are now sort of uh, in an environment or sort of uh, being very enthusiastic. I have this feeling that it does not depend on me. Yeah, he says that maybe literature, there was this idea of the intellectuals and I think what Mayorga usually says, when you have to create, you have to pay attention to the sound of the world and then give them back uh, poetry. And sometimes we live so fast, uh, we fail to appreciate poetry in life. And I think this has happened to you through prose. But there is poetry, the poetry of life. Yes, it's a very good quotation. It helps me create and create in a better way because otherwise you might fall into skepticism. And I would listen to a philosopher saying that I could be a pessimistic, but it's not the right time to be pessimistic. I think it's too easy now to be a pessimistic. How old was he, that philosopher? Okay, Marina, it was the lady philosopher who said that. Well, yes, she, she, she had a certain age already. Okay, now we can see people 
Yeah, there are many people listening to us. We were uh, hearing some people sort of uh, laughing. It's never easy to sort of uh, start with the first question. But since we were able to talk to this dark room full of ghosts and now we see them, maybe it's going to be easier. And I would like to finish, uh, she says, by saying that, you know, I will sort of uh, uh, defend cinema, theatre, music. I cannot live without cinema, without uh, theatre, without music, but literature is a way of being with myself it is a way of being with myself inside of me and i think our society still needs that you with a book you are in front of a voice talking to you and only to you and if you really like it you might answer back and there is a communication and to me that has no price and that is something that you cannot weigh from any other kind of uh, art. There are many kinds of art, but that sort of internal dialogue with oneself, within a context of a fantasy, of adventures, of uh, sometimes uh, liking something or disliking profoundly something, but being there in that dialogue, that is literature about, that is what literature is about at the end of the day. Yes, we previously mentioned that there is another genre and that is about dedications, but also making questions is a very difficult genre. I fully agree. Well, we usually go to universities, to schools, in order to sort of share this idea. I met Irigoyen when I was already at university at Bello Porto when I was uh, 20. Uh, so also at university. Now I think we are sort of more close uh, to literature, to literature and to writers. Yes, that is true. She says, yes, literature is something that we feel something like kind of uh, closer to us, and that is nice. That is beautiful. He says because maybe it was more like a mystified in the uh, past. It was something more like idealized. Now you can sort of watch people on the internet, you can YouTube them. In the past, you would sort of read a book not knowing the author and still feel very much about it. You know, there was those books about this sort of uh, uh, shanty house in Belbao, Luis Martin Hill, yes. For many years, I was really obsessed by this work. And then years later, I was in a different sort of period in my life. And then I learned that this was written by a Jesuit that then stopped being a Jesuit uh, father. But then you had all this information about that book, about these shanty houses. In the past, writers were like uh, uh, something more abstract. Yeah, that happened to me with this uh, Jesuit and his writings. Were there shanty towns in Bilbao? 
that's not possible. We also talked about schools and about teaching. In our particular case, this is like a bad joke, saying that Basque writers we should sort of follow this path of uh, uh, turning into professionals and also being teachers because we cannot read, live, make a living on our books. And this also takes me to that riddle about the eyelashes. Do you remember the first books by Albert Dania? We went to Amaraberri in San Sebastian and there was a lady there, she was pretty nervous and uh, usually young children, they ask you, they're really moved and they ask you, they're full of uh, enthusiasm and life and joy and they ask you uh, to sign their books. And then this lady, she uh, made me a gift and uh, then I realized only that she was uh, blind. Now, more and more, I pay attention to people that uh, use uh, the uh, Braille method to Braille method to write. And then she made a drawing for me. She uh, draw, drew uh, a child with a kite and a swallow, and that. It was really amazing to me and this is why after that I sort of uh, uh, put many blind people in my stories because I am blind to many things in life myself. Well in your particular case you're also fascinated by everything that is oriental, are you not? You mentioned Anderson and Anderson or Karen Brixen, um, it was the same for them. I think the case of uh, the Basque country, uh, weather is more and more almost, uh, well, uh, tropical and we have more and more palm trees. But in the past, I mean, uh, Bilbao used to be pretty grimy. So I think Anderson would also go to Africa searching uh, different sensuality and different colors. But as the Scartes used to say, I think therefore I exist. And I think now we should rather say, I feel, so I exist. I fly, so I exist. And I've been attracted uh, to that need. Uh, uh, to search for color. Yes, that's very European, she says, that search. And uh, forget uh, grimy places like what Bilbao used to be. I think in San Sebastian also we had an important writer that used to live in a very small flat and uh, would tell me that over the weekend they, she or he doesn't uh, take a shower because uh, um, it feels good to smell your own body. And this is something that we're no longer used to. So this is also the uh, metaphor by Shukri. Juan de Murriategui. I think it's about some memoirs. where he would be wearing a Moroccan dress, a chilaba. He would uh, live in Morocco, in Morocco for a long time, learned Arabic, and uh, in a book, he collects many interesting stories. For example, my father, he went to the army and he had uh, to learn to count up until 10 in Morocco. Well, one minute to go. Does anybody there making a question? Somebody in the audience? Okay, well, Maria Sin, so what do you recommend? Because uh, more and more books now are being uh, unclassified. So 
So would you uh, recommend a book? Because many of them are being put out of print. So which book would you recommend? One by Daniel Penac, that is out of print. The Wolf's Eyes, Los Ojos del Lobo. The Magic Cake. I don't remember the name of the author. It's an Australian writer. This sort of uh, magic padding or cake is like a magic book. When they eat this cake, magic padding. This is this, you know, this is about people being inspired by everything that is oriental. Just by reading the, the, the name, this magic padding, I mean, it's kind of funny. You yes? uh, reading the titles and you start laughing. Or it's like the wonderful uh, panda. And the illustration in the book uh, is really beautiful. This is part of, uh, uh, well, the uh, classical. It's by Bunny Blue Gun. By Norman Lindsay. Usually read to learn to refresh yourself and suddenly something is, is, is inspiring and then this takes you somewhere else but I really really recommend uh, you reading The Magic uh, Pavin by Norman Lindsay. I just want to say that uh, the author wrote this in a very tragic uh, night. This is these uh, authors that are uh, lived a very sad life. Uh, he was very depressive, and he wrote this book when the, they told him that his uh, brother died. That. Uh, he decided to uh, write this book about this uh, magic barnacle and then the penguin there. I really love this uh, book. And I love how literature for children can uh, uh, make the author set himself free from his sort of ghost. Or also uh, Lady uh, Loop or The Eyes of the Wolf. So after these uh, recommendations, we will be signing books for you outside. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.